So uh, uh, welcome everyone. Nice to see nice to see you all. Um, we are continuing with chapter five of Kohelet this morning of Ecclesiastes. Um, and uh, we've been studying this now for three months, three, four months, and going slowly through it. Um, and um, appropriate to our times. I mean, maybe Ecclesiastes is one of those books that's appropriate to every time. Um, because of its profound subject matters and questions. Um, but uh, we're, we are right now in the midst of the Omicron surge. And uh, as I said just a few minutes ago, uh, we are um, all learning the futility, the utter futility of trying to plan and know where this pandemic might go next. Um, and we're ju just living and being and doing the best with what we have. Um, and, and that mindfulness or that just being definitely appears to be one of the messages and conclusions of Kohelet. Um, and today in our chapter, um, which is an interesting, it seems to have a few different voices going on there, but um, we hear for one of the first times Kohelet actually say, instead of this is all futility, he actually says, well, this is something that's good. This is what you should do. So that's always nice to hear when he explicitly tells us this is what you should be doing. This is what is good. Um, but before that, um, we have um, some some more of his chokhmah, of his wisdom. And I, I, at least I feel that this chapter is closest so far what we've been studying to the other wisdom literature of uh, Proverbs and um, other, other biblical books. Um, or even later rabbin books echo some of those ideas. So we're going to begin our study. Anybody have any thoughts or comments as we begin? So let's let's dedicate our learning to um, to the health of all those who have the pandemic, and for our world to go to a place of greater health and sanity um, for all. Amen. Amen. Okay. Chapter five. Alan. Hey, uh, keep your mouth from being rash and mm -hmm. let not your throat be quick to bring forth speech before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. That is why your words should be few. <clears throat> Just as dreams <clears throat> come with much brooding, so does foolish utterance, utterance come with <laughs> much speech. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. <clears throat> For he has no pleasure in fools what you vow fulfill. It is better to not to vow at all than to vow and not fulfill. Don't let your mouth bring you into disfavor and don't plead before the messenger that it was an error, <coughs> but fear God, <coughs> else God may be angered by your talk and destroy your possessions. For much dreaming leads to futility and to superfluous talk. Okay, let's 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 stop there for now. There's three three sections to this chapter, and we'll go through them. The, this is a section that um, scholars, some scholars, wonder if it was inserted by an editor at a later time to bring some more, you know, typical mainstream piety into Kohelet's. Um, thoughts any any thoughts about all about what we just read it sounds like proverbs mm -hmm. it sounds a lot like proverbs <laughs> i mean the tone the tone here is very different from what has come before yeah very different and what what's its main message vows don't make rash vows um, or else the Lord will take away your possessions. Don't speak rashly, I guess, is what 
Um, Watch your speech. Yeah. Choose, yeah. Choose your words carefully. Yeah. yeah. Choose your words carefully. Yeah. Both quantity yeah. and quality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I love that. Right. Uh, the, the ethics of the father says, right, make make silence a fence to your wisdom, right? Say so this is that kind of don't is he is he implying that God can only hear our words and not understand our thoughts? It's it's a it's a really good it's a really good uh, comment and um, you know it, it's interesting. I I I I my sense at least is that the, the in the Bible at least and to some degree later on words are all important. You know words create reality. The world was created with words. God spoke to human beings at Sinai with words. Words have power over other people to hurt, to bring up. Words are powerful. Thoughts, you know, there, 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 are, there are verses which seem to say, you know, God can see into your heart, can see into your thoughts. But um, the, the, words are, the words are what's important. Are, are are very important, but it's true, right? If your if your if your speech is, um, uh, it, it's an interesting thoughts, right? If your your speech may be very correct and very good, but if your thoughts are full of horrible things, you know, what is where does that leave you? But but even if your thoughts are full of horrible things, you've decided not to act on them. You're not speaking of them, so it's in some way you can't control your thoughts, but you can control your speech. The, well, the, the being able to control the thoughts or not is 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 a is a is a, is a, is a big task, and I mean the, the Talmud actually goes into a whole long long discussion of whether a person is liable for their thoughts. So the example that Talmud gives is now if you if you go into a shop and in your mind you have no intention to buy anything in that shop, but you Why still come in and start haggling with the owner just out of fun or because you, you're is that fair or not? Because you have no intention to buy anything. Is that is that fair to the to the person who with whom you're you know is wasting their time with you? Um, that's a very a very kind of talkless pragmatic. But that in, that involves an action. It's not just your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> well the hmm. The, the, the even maybe the, the, the more direct question then again the Talmud is do you have to have sincerity when you pray mm. you, know, is it, you have to just say the words or do you need to be sincere in your heart when you pray and it, it, has, it has a tough. long yeah it has a long long um, discussion about it and eventually it says you only have to be sincere when you say two prayers the Shema and the beginning of the Amidah and all the rest it's enough to just say the words of course sincerity is <laughs> <laughs> Sincerity is is welcomed, but in terms of legislating it, if you say the Shema and you found your mind is totally wandered, you're supposed to go back and say it again until you've got it, um, because the you know but but it's a, it's a, it is it is a hard thing to um, to legislate for one, and the rabbis are always trying to legislate everything and trying to put their authority over everything, um, but here. Here it's, you know, in the, in, the, in the Bible, there's this powerful sense of words, right? The prophets would speak with words and, you know, convey God's might with the words. And this whole idea of making a vow, which to us doesn't make that much sense, you know, because we don't really have that concept in our society. We're, we're, we're more of a talking society these days in the, than the Clint Eastwood, you know, uh, can stay silent kind of society perhaps but the um you know in biblical times when you said something it meant a lot and if you brought in a vow which seemed to be a common practice where you would vow to do something before god you better do it so you're gonna you're gonna get in trouble um, so what does this mean keep your mouth from being rash and let not your throat I, straight away, I heard somebody laugh, and I thought, "Well, this is—is is this speaking to us as COVID? Keep your mouth from." Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but be quick to bring forth speech from God, for God is in heaven, you are on earth. What does that mean? For God is in heaven, and you are on earth, and that is why your words should be few. 
i.e., you're not in a, you're not in heaven. Is it i.e., you're not in heaven yet? So make your words few, or is it because um, my friend's granddaughter used to tell her, "Your your brain and your mouth are not connected," <laughs> because she would just say the most ridiculous things. Yeah, well, I, I think it's here. It's also it's like at least the way the commentators often view this is what you talk about often too is. The God is in heaven, and where is a heaven? Heaven is up there, and from heaven you can see everything. So I, God, is up there and watching everything you do. So, like I careful. told you, that's what my mother yeah. told me. Better be good. God's watching you. Exactly. God, God, God's at the top of the of the Sears oh. building with a telescope, right. <laughs> and he can see what you're doing. <laughs> um, just as dreams come with much brooding. Yeah. So does foolish utterance come with much speech? What's that image? It's an interesting image. Kiva achalom berov inyan. Inyan means not just um, brooding, but busyness or with uh, a lot of matter. So the dreams come with a lot going on. Um, Right, just like you wake up from your dreams and you realize your dreams, I mean, are, you know, an analyst would say your dreams are telling you a lot about who you are, so don't ignore them, but maybe that's not every dream. But, um, you know, you wake up and you're like, oh, thank God I'm out of that dream, or, you know, that was just my, my mind chattering. So, so sometimes we chatter a lot with our speech, and at the end you realize, well, that was all just, all just chatter. Um, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it, for he has no pleasure in fools what you vow fulfill. This is, this is very stark, pietistic kind of uh, direction, right? Well, so often people will say when something terrible is happening in their lives, you know, God, if you just fix this or help me with this, I will be good, you know, right. I will do yeah. all these good deeds. And then they forget about it the next week when things are better. That's true, very true. It's, it's interesting, people, you're right. That's a really good example. People <coughs> people do that a lot. And it's sometimes that's to bring people to shul or to minion and kind of changes their shul going habits. I know my, 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 my father's mother, she went she she had a number of miscarriages and um but anyway she uh, and she at some point something like that happened and then she started to go to shul every week after that um because she so she fulfilled her vow that was good she fulfilled her vow yeah she did it yeah you know um if you get me out of this god i will blah 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 um yeah so it's same better the power of words. I mean, there is something that the, do you all connect to that? The power of words and the power of our speech, or does it feel outdated? I always wonder. Well, it, it's it seems to me that if you put writing in with words, you're talking about a very powerful tool that groups of humans use to construct their reality. So mm -hmm. there's absolutely power with writing and with words. Uh, writing mm -hmm. into the same the same group as speaking. In fact, even more powerful because we we read people who have written thousands of years ago, like for example, the Torah, and we it it becomes a very powerful uh, not more than impression. It becomes a very powerful formation of our current world. Hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, and and as you as you were talking, I was thinking not a. a writing as well but i was thinking of the, the the nazis during world war ii i mean the power of um you know their leader's speech was such that you know kind of hip, hypnotized people speech speech and writing uh, you know people people use the bible for good for for good and also for bad you know reading it thousands of years later and being inspired to do things or take positions sometimes um sometimes for good and sometimes they don't quite understand uh, the, um, what it's really saying or take it differently. Um, and, you know, there's, I mean, I can't, I can't think of any other religion for any other religion that has such a strong idea of the power of words. And there's so many 
rabbinic, you know, I, I always see them as a little bit pietistic, but the ideas of Lashon Hara, of watching your words, of, of really zero gossip, you know, zero talking about other people and, and all these ideas. How do you know when your, your speech is? Because, but they, uh, it is true that they, you know, the, the, there are studies that show that they're in the brain's activity when you, when you talk about another person and you change your opinion of them because of somebody else saying something about them, something changes in your brain. You know, there's a, you know, if you, if you thought positively about somebody and then somebody comes and, you know, says blah, 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 and kind of suddenly reveals something that can change something in your brain, which is, you know, maybe how you see that person, you know, it's a very, words are, are have that, pow have a power to them. And, um, the Baal Shem Tov, he says it's it's like words build, have a life of their own, right? They build a cloud. So either you build a positive cloud when you keep saying positive things about somebody, then you build a positive cloud. Sometimes you build a negative cloud. It's like a dark cloud. And each person who comes adds a little bit more and it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And then there's this big cloud. And sometimes it has nothing to do with reality. It's just uh, the power of, of words. And then in Kabbalah, words... You know, words are a uniquely human um, characteristic that come from our soul. We're, we're called the speakers in Kabbalah, Medaber, where human beings are those who speak and with the power of words. We name things, we control things. We, it's a, it's a very, very, there's a whole, a whole world into talking about that. But let's go for it. Um, don't let your mouth bring you into disfavor and don't plead before the messenger that it was an error. But fear God, else God may be angered by your talk and destroy your possessions. What does it mean, plead before the messenger? It says, the messenger is the angel. So the, the rabbinic thinking is that it's, this is talking about the, the angel who greets you after you die, you know. Don't come and when you're being faced when you die and the angel tells you, well, what about, what about that, those words you said there? Um, and you say, sorry, it was an angel. It was, an, it was a, a, I did it not on purpose or I wasn't thinking because that won't gain you entry into. Do they want God, they want the angel to put in a good word for God, for you? Right, exactly, for, for your judgment, right. Yeah, put the, you want the angel to, to, to look favorably to your judgment, put in a good, yeah, put in a good word. So if you say, you know, hey, I, 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 I wasn't doing that on purpose anyway. <laughs> yeah, many people say that. <laughs> while, while you're alive, be thinking. Uh, yes. Be thinking before mm -hmm. you. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, be thinking in general. Be thinking because it might feel like everything is just, you know, passing by, but there's, you know, we're, we're everything is, Everything is being marked. It's feeling very Rosh Hashanah-ish reading this, but the, uh, you know, the the uh, what's his name, uh, Rabbi Akiva, who says, you know, there's, you know, God is like the the merchant with God as ledger, and he writes everything that comes in and everything that goes out, and at the end of it, makes an accounting to see how much is left. You know, what's your what's your total, how much you owe, or how much you're in the and there's. You know, there, there is, there is forgiveness and, and there is, um, there is grace, but there's also that. He talks about destroy your possessions and yeah. he doesn't say destroy your health. He doesn't mm -hmm. say destroy your soul. Possessions are sort of the lowest level of attachments that we have. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, for the first level of attachments is possessions. And then mm -hmm. we have kids, which are a little higher than possessions, most of them. And then you have, and then you have, then you have your health. This is sort of Maimonides classification. Don't put that into writing, though. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, oh, kids. Sort of a low. I would say this is a low-level threat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the, uh, I like that. Well, in, in the Hebrew, it's maaseyadecha, the deeds of your hands. Maase, um, deeds. Yadecha, yeah, the deeds of your hands. He's going to destroy the deeds of your hands. Um, which maybe is maybe is a little bit broader than the uh, but right it's it's the yeah 
But what, what would be right? Your health would be worse, right? If, if yeah. God would destroy. So God isn't so vengeful. He'll take away your health for, for speaking poorly. But he might take away your, your new car or your... Uh... Oh, Farm. Yeah, for much dreaming leads to futility and to superfluous talk. I don't know. I think dreaming's okay. Oh, um, I do. <laughs> much dreaming. Much dreaming. That's true. Okay. Love. It's all about love. Dreaming. A little dreaming's okay, but much dreaming <laughs> yeah, leads to futility and superfluous talk. Yeah, yeah. Well, I overly I, dream. I, 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 what, what, what comes to mind is. Um, maybe a different kind of dreaming, but you know the uh, uh, somebody somebody I know now, um, quite a bit older. But he he, when he was young, he lives in Israel. Um, he's he's Israeli. He's lived in Israel his whole life. But he's an Orthodox um, man and uh, one, really wonderful man. But very very kind of caught up in his um, inner life and. He'd go every week to the Kotel for Friday night and he would just go on and on and pray, but then realize his family were waiting for him back home to start the meal, you know, and he'd come there and come back at 9 p.m. And so, you know, it's too many love. And actually the word love comes up a lot in this whole passage we read, too much, right? It's so, that's why it feels a little bit like the wisdom literature. The Because um, in, in, in the Hebrew, it's actually the many, many much dreaming, um, again, another word, harbe again means a lot. Um, you know, you know, we're, we're talking about um, being caught, not being. Kohel is pretty pragmatic. That's the truth, right? Kohel is pragmatic. Is is the I I don't know the Hebrew, but is the word for dreaming? Is it more specific than that? Because there's, you know, like dreaming at night when you're sleeping, there's daydreaming, there's, you could think about yeah. dreaming as, as, you know, you've got really something specific in mind and you keep thinking about it. You know, there's, I guess, lots of different ways that you can dream. That, that's very true. Well, the, the, the word for dreaming is the same word as the dreams at night. And I can't believe he would be saying, stop dreaming at night because we don't have too much control over that. So it must be the same as in English, which is interesting in most languages that the dreaming at night is similar to the idea of having being a dreamer, of having the mind kind of stuck in dreams. Um, I'm not sure if that's a human connotation to, to connect those dreams or if it starts in some kind of linguistic tradition and then gets carried through to different cultures and languages but in the hebrew it seems to be i mean right joseph is a dreamer in every way right he actually has dreams and he's good at interpreting dreams but the way the torah portrays him he's also dreamy um, in that sense um okay uh, okay, so now we're going to read the next part. Um, would someone else like to read this next part? We're going to sh we're shifting tones a little bit. Well, I can read. Okay, thanks. If, if you see in a province oppression of the poor and suppression of right and justice, don't wonder at the fact, for one high official is protected by a higher one and both of them by still higher ones. Thus, the greatest advantage in all the land is his. He controls a field that is cultivated. A lover of money never has his fill of money, nor a lover of wealth his fill of income. That too is futile. As his substance increases, so do those who consume it. What then does the success of its owner amount to but feasting his eyes? A worker's sleep is sweet, whether he has much or little to eat, but the rich man's abundance doesn't let him sleep. Here is a grave evil I have observed under the sun, riches hoarded by their owner to his misfortune. 
Mm. In that, that those riches are lost in some unlucky venture, and if he begets a son, he has nothing in hand. Another great evil is this. He must depart just as he came, as he came out of his mother's womb. So must he depart at last. Naked as he came, he can take nothing of his wealth to carry with him. So what is the good of his toiling for the wind? Besides all his days, he, can, he eats in darkness with much vexation and grief and anger. Thank you. Uh, let's see, and then we'll, we'll finish afterwards. This is a more familiar Kohelet, no? Yeah. yeah. Uh, returning to something he's been talking a lot about. Um, the, you know, don't, don't be too focused, the, the, the downsides of accumulation of wealth, the dangers of accumulation of wealth. So he, in some ways he says it here more clearly than he has before. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm curious as to um, what the line, thus uh, the greatest advantage in all the land is his. He controls a field that is cultivated. And what does that have to do with the sentence before? I, I think that the is talking about uh, the, if you're a high official and you can you can then um, you can you can oppress the poor and um, make them work for you. I think. Um, but I'll, I'll give me a. I mean, he's speaking about corruption, right? In that first verse, it seems um, quite clear. And then the, what it makes me think of is um, living living in, in in India, and how much corruption there was over there and this is just a, a, a complete fact of life you know every, everything is corrupted and there's no morality uh, and the power um you know the poor are suppressed or you know through the caste system for for generations and don't have any means of redress um and um the corruption just goes from higher and higher official and i remember the story of once Calcutta, which was where uh, we were living, um, and the uh, you know the, the its twin city was London, and London donated you know billions of dollars of pounds to redo their whole sewer system, and it started with a four or five billion pounds, but by the time it got down to how much was left to do the work, there was less than one billion left because everybody everybody took their uh, their fair share. Um, and then, so that's just a, uh, uh, that's just a, so um, we are at verse seven. Go ahead. Um, verses seven and eight are really different than most of the other verses we've encountered, whether the ones immediately after them or before, because it says, um, you know, you're going to have corruption and they're protected, but there's no consequence. You know, this is like, he doesn't talk about it being futile. He doesn't talk about, be, about it um, in a, any kind of negative consequence. It's just, if it's there, it's there. And, you know, you can't really do anything about it. And it's just going to continue. And um and that's it and yet the you know if you go to nine he talks about you know you never have enough and that's futile and you know he that he doesn't use his favorite word futile so in seven and eight which just kind of is surprising but maybe as the king um that's what he sees and he knows that that's what happens <sighs> One, one other way of reading this, which is the way Ibn Ezra, the, com the Spanish commentator, reads this, is that verse 8 is saying the greatest advantage, the greatest benefit is to be on the land yourself 
and you can, can you can cultivate the land yourself. I agriculture is the best thing. You know, if you have your own piece of land and you can cultivate your land and nobody can bother you, you'll have your food. You'll, as we read a little bit later, you'll sleep well, everything will be good. But if you think it's good to be an official, then there's always going to be a higher official above you who's going to make your life, you know, difficult. And um, so in fact, um, it's better, you know, this is the king who's, you know, having to always watch every official over every official and, you um, trying to control all of it. And he's saying, I wish I was a farmer and I could just live on the land and do my thing. Great, thank but you. It, but it does feel different, I agree. These two verses feel different than, you know, suddenly he's caring about the poor um, and talk, caring about mishpat and sedek of justice. Um, Anybody have any other thoughts about this? Okay. Um, a lover of money never has his fill of money, nor a lover of wealth his fill of income. That too is futile. Why is that? That uh, having money, love, having money breeds a desire for more of it. Uh, having does having food breed a desire for more food? Uh, does having women breed a desire for more women? Maybe, but uh, money has some sort of a special role in human culture. It it seems to be uh, it seems to be a little bit more magical than all of the other things. Well, money, in some ways, is is the most concentrated form of materialism, perhaps, because it's yeah. Yeah. that's it's the, but all the other things are also materialistic when you have a. When you have something that, you know, that it's addictive to order stuff to the Amazon because you get it so quick, your your doesn't your gratification is so high, so you keep ordering more and more and more, right? So it's a, it's a, it's this is the power of materialism. You know, you get you keep keep getting convinced you need more and more and more, but the it's part of the 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 world that you can never be satiated with materialism because as you just it never will satiate your will never satiate your soul so you're always going to be trying to get more but what you really this is the 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 nice way of looking at it is that your soul is really what wants to be satiated and it's not going to be satiated by all the stuff so it just becomes an addiction while um matters of the soul and of the intellect perhaps and of the heart can satiate um your soul and make you feel like you got enough. Um, on the other hand, it's easy for somebody who has a lot of wealth to say this, right? If you, if you don't have, you know, if you're, if you're lacking in money, then you wish you had a little, you, you, you might not agree with that. You'd say that's a... But there's a difference between wanting a little more money so you eat better and wanting more money so you have more money than your neighbor and just so that wealth in and of itself. Mm -hmm. That seems at that level, it can never be satiated. And in that right. sense, I would agree with it. Right, at that, at, that, at that level where, and I mean, there's also speak, you know, connecting to the verse before, there's a, not always, but there's often a level where if you're making money at the very, very high levels, very oh, yeah. high levels, you often, it's, it often involves other people not getting what they should. You know, I, I had a, mm -hmm. uh, had a, 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 a friend who, who lives um, in Los Angeles, who comes from a, a family that's one of the biggest families in real estate. And he was saying when some of the, they were, he was being taught some of the business by some of the people that were hired and he didn't like all of it. You know, it's part of how do you make the big money by operating in the gray? You know, if not, you're not going to make the big money, but when you operate in the gray, that's where you make the big money. And so um, somebody's going to lose out. Um, so what about this? Again, we're, this is so inter interesting, right? We, we've had so often this ver this word of love of a lot. Birvot has his 
as uh, his substance increase, as his goodness increase, again, the rabu, again, this is a lot, so does those who consume it. Is that, are those his dependents, i.e., you win the lottery and suddenly you're everybody's best friend and your fourth cousin gives you a call? Um, then what does the success of its owner amount to but feasting his eyes? What does that mean, feasting his eyes? <laughs> you can't enjoy it because everybody else is always trying to take it from you. Is that what it? And what? What the? Well, you know, part part of you know people people who are doing well very quickly get onto a list, and suddenly every charity and its <laughs> there is calling you up to ask you for donations, right? Um, Or is it saying something different? No, no, does it, it, it sounds to me like maybe the mm. owner of all this money um, keeps feasting his eyes on the pile of money that he's, that he's built and wants more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a very um, a strong image, isn't there, you know? Well, it has a hunger feeling to it. So it ha has an overwhelming, overweening sense of desire for more. Uh, so so it, it, the, the having some money infects you in some strange way. Uh, it makes you want more. And, and that's why I think money has a sort of a, a magical quality. It, it, it does something noxious to us. Lots of it does. Just uh, mm -hmm. being... Well, it, pl it plays it plays on that deep, and also the the need for security and for you know we that deep human need to feel like we're not we're, we're we feel safe and secure and our families are safe and secure and so the suddenly having more makes you think. Or, um, hmm. and can I bring you back to verse eight? And if if it's too late for verse no, eight, no, no, I go ahead. That. Okay, because mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to understand it. Uh, and um, uh, 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 altar and the JPS and the uh, and the uh, and the old King James uh, and and in the Hebrew at the end I'm just talking about the second half the uh, second colon who Melech was Lasade Nevad and and our text here says uh, now I've lost it um, he controls a field that he controls is a field that is cultivated. And Alter says, uh, translates it, a king is subject to the field. Mm -hmm. And the old uh, King James says, the King James says, uh, the king himself is served by the field. And I can see all those things sort of in there. But do you have a, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's I think really, this is obscure somewhat. And I'm trying to figure it, it out. It is very, it is very obscure. It's, you know, it could okay. be, as they were saying, who melech. He who is the king, um, you know, a king is dependent on the field, right? Who uh melech, -huh. you could say, who melech nevad is, nevad is, right, it's a nifal, so it's, 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 de it's dependent, his work is dependent on the field. Even a king yeah. is dependent, even a king is dependent on the field, meaning that, you yeah. know, it's better to, better to own you, to, to have your own field and be in control of your food source, because even a king, he needs to eat from somebody's field. Um, yeah. That's one way, and that's not why JPS and go with it. But you know, it's, it's so it's hard because the the four words could mean so many things. <laughs> yeah. Um, melech lesade, um, one who is one who is you know melech is to you know one who rules over the field um, is. Um, he controls a field that is cultivated. The field is cultivated, you know. Um, uh, uh, Alter has a comment. His yeah. greatest, yes. The greatest advantage is to is to is to control a is to control a field that is cultivated. Go ahead. What does Alter say? Yeah. No. That, yes, that's helpful. Actually. He says. Alter says the evident sense of the whole verse. He's certainly. <laughs> I don't know how evident it is when he says has to say that. Uh, is that both the economy and political power depend on agriculture. And I think that's actually 
a very plausible way of, of reading it. Uh, but it, it, I just wanted to, uh, it's, you, you've shown me that you, you, there are reasons to be confused about it, but, but that's not a bad observation about, about the uh, ancient world or the, for that matter, uh, um, our world to some extent. So uh, yeah, and, and that's that's how Ibn Ezra takes it too. Uh huh. Um, I see. But it's, yeah, that's what I thought you were saying. Um, the, the, Thank the, you. The, yeah. the, 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 in that sense, that the yeah, um, the, uh, you know, the agriculture, the working of the land. But it's it's you know Hebrew is the, 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 there's not if there were a few more words to get a sense of which way mm -hmm. the Hebrew was falling, we'd have a clearer sense of what it was saying. Uh, but the king, the, the king is dependent on the workers who cultivate exactly. the fields as yeah, well. Yeah. He's not in total control. Exactly, and and that works well with you know Kohelet realizing how much he controls and how much he doesn't. And this and the verse eleven then about where he's saying about how it's nice to just be a worker, where right? a worker's sleep is sweet. Uh, I'm not sure we've come across this word sweet yet. Kohelet is not very sweet. He hasn't spoken about many things being sweet, but a worker's sleep is sweet, whether he has much or little to eat, but the rich man's abundance doesn't let him sleep. I think that's a very, very powerful statement. Um, you know, the, the king or the, the person living in their big mansion, but it's hard for him to sleep, but the one who's engaged in physical the kibbutzniks would definitely agree with that. They would like that verse. Um, it's kind of saying that sleep, just sleeping well is one of the sweetest things, right? You can have all the money in the world, but if you're sleeping horribly, there's um, not always much you can do about it. Um, well, and the rich man probably has worried about who's going to take his money or how he's going to lose it or not just in, in getting more, but in how to control it so he can't sleep worrying about it. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think again of the, when that, being in the India and in Nepal later on in my life, and you know, in, in Nepal, spending some time in these little villages, mud huts where the, the Nepalese would, and their whole life was simple, right? They went out to the fields, they worked the fields. Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to romanticize it too much, because when the fields didn't produce this as they needed to, they were in deep trouble and there was a lot of alcoholism and a lot of abuse and all kinds of troubles. But um, on the other hand, they seem to be very simply happy, right? Just living their lives. You work your field, you come back at the end of the day, you know you've done your good work and you sleep well and you, know, you, eat, your, they, you eat your big breakfast before you go out into the field, right? And then you, uh, you eat your snack in the field and you come back at night and that's, that's your life. Um, but the king, maybe the king, the king, the grass is always greeted on the other side, right? So a lot of those workers would give a lot to be like the king, not having to do that. I don't think a worker's sleep is sweet. Yeah. Uh -huh. Depends. If, if, if the agriculture is going well, then maybe the, the, agri, the workers' sleep is, can be sleep because they're, um, they're doing what they need to do. At the end of the day, they've done. There's no more they need to. They go to sleep and that's it. But I, I agree. It's not quite as clear cut. Um, here is a grave evil I've observed. A sick evil, really, is what he's saying. In more, there is a sick evil I observe on the sun. Richers that are guarded by their owner to the misfortune of their of their owner of their shepherd. Hmm. Again, this idea of of guarding your riches being leading you to trouble. And in that those riches are lost in some unlucky venture. And if he begets a son, he has, he has nothing in hand. Yes, so it's almost right. as if you, you, know, you spend all your time building it and then it's just lost. And you spend all that time building it and then you have nothing. Um, I'm going to go forward a little bit. I want to get to at least a good part a little bit. Um, another grave evil is this. He must depart just as he came, as he came out of his mother's womb, 
So as he departed last naked as he came, he can take nothing of his wealth to carry with him. That we know is true. Can't take your can't take your wealth with you wherever you go next. Except that sounds angry at the at a wealthy person, also. Mm -hmm. Angry at who? Sorry. Angry, angry because he's wealthy. I mean, every yeah. every single wealthy person isn't a bad person. Exactly. No, very true. Very true. I um, maybe maybe talking about. Um, you know, that that when it becomes greed and that greed for getting wealth. Right. You, know, you can't take you can't take everything you take with you. And you know, the you know, I've got a, a member of my extended family who who did really, really well. And you know, at the end of their life when they had all kinds of memory loss issues, kind of what stuck with them was just their the wealth you know they were going around talking about you know you know how much this is worth and how much this is worth and speaking it was like this the obsession of money carried on and they'd they'd lost a lot of their cognitive abilities and kind of what stayed is what they'd spent their life worrying about and it was it was really sad to see them you know like why aren't you thinking and talking about your grandchildren and about your family all you are is you're stuck on this this thing about the money and who's going to take it from you and are people going to come and take it from you? And it was, it was really unhealthy. It was sick. Um, you know, everything that he says about things being so futile are true. Yeah. During this last couple of years with this pandemic, you look around at some of the possessions that you gather and you think, what good are they? You can't use them. You can't go anywhere. You can't put them on. You can't drive them. You can't like hardly enjoy them. So yeah. he's there. Coyle is very right about a lot of things being very futile. Beautiful, yeah. This for these few years really have kind of driven a lot of yeah. a lot of that home about what's few, what's what's futile and what's real and what you need and what you don't really need. Yeah, yeah, really, that's very very true. I I, I have a problem here with okay. verse eleven. A worker's sleep is sweet whether he has much or little to eat, but the rich man's abundance does not let him sleep. So there's, it's, it's setting up a rich man versus a poor man's life, right? And throughout Kohelet, we keep talking about the rich man or the man with stuff, right? The man with all the blessings, the man who, who should be happy because he's got all this stuff but is unhappy because pursuit of all this stuff is futile. What mm -hmm. the problem I'm having here is when that gets contrasted with the worker, especially after verse seven, where you see in a province oppression of the poor, suppression of white injustice, and all these people who are above him. So it's it's real clear that the worker is um the worker has much more of a struggle under the sun than um than a rich man does because a worker even though they're working if they don't have anything to eat they're not going to sleep you don't yeah. sleep yeah. if you're hungry you cannot sleep if you're hungry and if you're worried about how you're going to feed yourself the next day Mm -hmm. That's not futile. That also that that's also an issue. I'm confused why why the image of the worker, why the the poor man, um, is is being almost romanticized. Really. Romanticized, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's not reality. That's not that's not the reality that we know. I mean so, so I, I I I I agree and I think let's go forward because I think we'll we'll get to where he's landing with all of it and at least one way of understanding it. But there there is, you know, it could be um you know the simple pleasures of just and you know, Kohelet might not know what it's like to be a poor man, right? So he's mm, clearly he's, not. He's, he's clearly, yes. Very it. clearly. Um, um, but there is, I mean, I know it might also be a, a man's thing, right? Men, even men who work in offices and have, you know, they romanticize if sometimes if only I could just do a good, 
you know, good day's work of working around and instead of just being on my desk, you know, using my body and kind of uh, feeling physically tired at the end of the day and being able to sleep properly because I've, you know, I'm doing what, what I was built to do. Um, but uh, let's let's go for it. I think I think it will land. It will land in a, an interesting place. So besides what is all the of toiling for the wind. Um, besides, so what what is the good of toiling for his winds? Besides all those days he eats in darkness, um, with much vexation and grief and anger. Is that symbolic? You know of the of his state of mind. Um, um, and and uh, and he's again harbe so much. The coming again, this these word for a lot. Um, and he's but let's go, let's go for it. Okay. Uh, somebody read for us these last few verses. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll read. Only okay. this I have found is a real good that one should eat and drink and get pleasure with all the gains he has made under the sun during the number of days of life that God has given him, for that is his portion. Also, whenever a man is given riches and property by God, mm. and is also permitted by him to enjoy them and to take his portion and get pleasure for his gains, that is a gift of God. For such a man will not brood much over the days of his life because God keeps him busy enjoying himself. So... It seems to be that what he's what he's saying is um, is all about your portion. You know, when you accept your portion, whether it's this or that, and live your portion with you know with joy and accepting it, then you'll get enjoyment out of your life. You know, whether it's this kind of life or that kind of life, um, and that is and and it's a gift to be given a portion that's um, the, all the things that you get in your life that you're able to really. Um, live with and enjoy our gift and should be taken as a gift and that's um, right the word portion comes here again and again um, and that's and that's where the simchat libo is the joy of his heart the end of because God keeps him busy enjoying himself um, but if you take that too far you can say people are poor because God decided they weren't worthy. I, I think that can be a real trap as well. Mm -hmm. And you have to be careful of that. It's fatalistic, right? It's, a, it's, it's uh, this is where, I mean, when the only times I've ever heard in India of anybody trying to defend the caste system were people who said, obviously it's not working as it was supposed to, but they defend it by saying, you know, everybody knew his place and was just content living with their portion and trying to reach God as best they could from their portion. Of course, and it becomes hereditary and it's abused and all these things. And um, I, I'm not satisfied with that necessarily. But the people um, that uh, say that are usually on the top. Mm -hmm. Right, the people who say that are, the people who say, who, who make the argument <laughs> on the top, but they're, but they're, Nobody but they're on the bottom says that. <laughs> yeah, true. no kidding. But it, but it's also it's also it's also it's not very American, right? And the the American ideal is you all oh, you all can, you you all can hook into the time the here. There's a certain strain of Americanism that if you don't make it, it's your own fault. Meritocracy, right? Yeah, it, it is, hard it is, work. It hard work will pull you through. Doesn't matter yeah. that we've got a racist society <laughs> or a, yeah, or a but, but, but plutocracy. In America, or any of that, right? Everybody thinks you can make it, right? Everybody should be able to make it, right? So you can all be a Which superhero. Which is this isn't true. You can you can all be a superhero. You can all everybody can can go beyond what they have and make it, and that's that's the American dream. I'm just saying there's some cultures where they're a lot more fatalistic. It's like, you've been given what you've been given and just live with it, you know? And America is always trying to push everybody and saying everyone's born with the ability. And so there, there's wisdom in both, right? There is some, right? Pierre Kiel, but I think that father says, be content with your lot. I mean, obviously if you're very poor then maybe you shouldn't be content, but there's something to be said about being, this is the way it's understood. Be content with your physical lot, but be discontent with your spiritual lot. I spend your days working on your spiritual lot, not on your physical lot. And you know, don't you know? We're we're, we're taught the bigger the house, the bigger the car, the bigger this, the better, right? And I mean that. Obviously, there's a level of poverty 
where you know everybody should be should have enough to live. Um, but there is there is wisdom and happiness is not just in acquiring more and more and more. Another hand is fatalistic. You know, you know, you're you should be you should just be happy with your lot at the bottom and not try and struggle upwards is also problematic, obviously. Um, but there is there is there at least you know in in Kohelet's view and in Pierre Kiavod's view, there is wisdom in um, in, in being content. Um, with your with your lot or living living with your lot as best you can it doesn't mean you shouldn't try and work your way upwards and do better but um, maybe also to be be content with how it turns out rabbi my problem with it more is it doesn't say to the people that have a lot that you have a responsibility to society to make it a little fair not at all yeah. that's a totally foreign yeah. concept to that idea yeah. That's and I find that true. somewhat problematic. Well, That's more than true. somewhat, I find that problematic. Yeah, no, I think it's it's very it's very true that in that kind of thinking, often that's what, you know, everybody has their lot. So you should just be happy with your lot as being poor. I should be happy with my lot as being. But on the other hand, you know, when you connect a teaching to that, which is the, you know, part of being, part of having your lot as being wealthy is giving to others and the tithing and, you know, helping others, then if you, if you link it to that, it can be a powerful way to, to live. Um, but I mean, there is, there is also, I think there's, there's, there's also wisdom in when there's only, when there's so much discontent with where, where everybody is at, then that doesn't give people dignity in their lives, you know, and, mm. and part of it, and part of it is subjective, you know, there, there is a subjective, you know, what is, where is the place where you have enough? That's decided by society, you know, because mm -hmm. in in Nepal, you know, having enough, you know, being middle class is living ten people in a three apartment, three three room apartment, and not having a car, and probably not, and having one small TV. That's considered enough. Well, for us, if you if you would have that in our society, you would feel horrible about yourself. You would feel, you know, you're at the bottom, and that you're you're you 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 would. You would, you would feel as if you really don't have enough. And I'm not saying you shouldn't feel that way. I'm just saying it's, it is very subjective on some level. All right, um, a lot to think about. And, um, you know, the Kohelet, Kohelet is taking us in interesting directions. Um, and, um, you know, obviously the, the fatalism is not constructive in many times. And, you know, just be content with your lot. You're sick, you're that, no, that that's not where we wanna go with it. You know, we should, every person should, should try and improve to, to, get, to, to get to enough and to, to feel fulfilled in their lives. Um, and let's end with a prayer that we should all um, stay healthy and keep healthy and, um, and, and, uh, and also, um, help others um, who are not as blessed as we are. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you, you. thank you. I got thank you. plenty of nothing. <laughs> <laughs>